Hello and welcome to Focus on Liberia. My name is Dennis Jai and we are broadcasting from Atlanta, Georgia. As part of the Black History Month, uh, for the month of February, we at Focus on Liberia, are, we are presenting Liberian history. Last week, we had the history of elections and referendum in Liberia. This week, we're going to continue Liberian history in commemoration of Black History Month and the topic today is the dominant presidency. The dominant presidency, we're gonna be looking at the history, the effects and reform. My guest is Dr. George Clay Kier. Dr. Kier, welcome to Focus on Liberia. Thank you very much, Dennis, very for the invitation. Much. I'm glad to be here. Thank you, and uh, we are glad to have you for the second or third time on focus on Liberia, the first time you uh, you were here, we went over the uh, a clean sweep of the history of Liberian presidents from J Joseph Jenkins Roberts to George Manning Weir. So we are glad once again to have you commemorating Black History Month, and we're going to be talking about the dominant presidency. By way of introduction, Dr. Kier is uh, no stranger to us here at Focus on Liberia. He is. Um, the, uh, he was the interim chair. Oh, somebody keep calling me here. Currently, he's the dean of the Barbara Jordan McKee Leland School of Public Affairs and professor professor of political science at Texas Southern University. He's also the professor of international relations at the Graduate School of uh, AME University in Monrovia. Once again, Dr. Kia, we want to say welcome to Focus on Liberia. Thank you very much, Dennis. Thank you. I'm glad to be and, here. And we want to welcome our viewers from across the globe. Uh, at Focus on Liberia, we educate, we elevate, and promote all things Liberia. Today, our topic is the dominant presidency. Some people call it the King Kong presidency. So the dominant presidency, we're going to be looking at the history, the effects, and reforms. How do we change it? How do we cage this lion? this big monster called the Liberian, <laughs> uh, the dominant presidency. But before we get into our topic, we just want to have a few, uh, an opening statement from Dr. Kia regarding Black History Month and the uh, the uh, the importance of having Liberian history during this time of Black History Month for obvious reason what I say, Liberian history is Black history. Dr. Kia, your introductory remark. Well, thank you again, Dennis. Uh, thank you and your colleagues. Uh, focus on Liberia, not just only for the kind invitation to appear on your show again for the third time, uh, but for the premise, you've, you've covered uh, varied topics here relating to Liberia, uh, and that is very important, not just only educating Liberians, uh, but those who have interest in the country as well. So. I certainly want to commend you and your colleagues. And as you've put it best, Liberia history is also uh, Black history. So uh, as we commemorate Black History Month in February, uh, focusing on Liberian history as part of that uh, broader project uh, uh, is something that is really welcome. So I'm, I'm looking forward uh, to our discussion uh, today on the dominant presidency and to the subsequent discussions we have on the Liberian presidency. Thank you. And uh, the subsequent discussion uh, Dr. Kia is talking about today, we're going to cover as part of Black History Month and Liberian history, we're going to be looking at the dominant presidency, effects, history, and reform. The next time Dr. Kia is back here, we're going to be talking about the centralized state. Liberia is a centralized state. I know uh, people have been calling for decentralization, but for now, we have the centralized state. We're going to look at the effect of the centralized state and the history, what the effects have been. And of course, reform. We never want to close our broadcast without talking about how we can make it better. And then part two, still talking about the president, we're going to talk about their development policies of the president. We're going to cover at least from Barclay to the current president, look at the development policies. We're not going to stop there. We're going to also look at the uh, national vision. 
we're going to look at all that. But for today, let's concentrate on the dominant presidency. Dr. Key, I want to start by saying, what is the dominant presidency? A very good question, uh, uh, Dennis. And as you uh, is described in various ways, uh, both uh, uh, in the academic literature in, and in everyday discussion, some call it the hegemonic presidency, some call it the imperial presidency too. The imperial presidency, of course, is the one that has wider currency. Uh, but uh, the short end of it is that the dominant presidency is one in which uh, the presidency as the centerpiece of the executive branch of government uh, sort of uh, controls the machinery of the government. And by the, when I say control, uh, it includes the other two, executive and legislative branches, uh, in ways in which those two branches cannot perform uh, their check and balances functions as well. Uh, even if those two, the legislative as, and judicial branches have constitutional as well as statutory granted uh, powers, the dominant presidency makes it very difficult for them to exercise those powers. So uh, because you have imbalance in the system, the, the president, who then is the occupant of the, of the office, as you know, uh, is therefore not held accountable. And, that's, and that usually is the recipe for authoritarianism. Okay, so as you said, this dominant presidency is known by different names. Some call it, and the popular name for in Liberia is imperial presidency. And uh, yeah. others say the hegemonic presidency. And I, I watched the show King Kong, so I call it the King Kong presidency. <laughs> What? That's appropriate. <laughs> right. So let's look at some of the characteristics of the dominant presidency. I know you kind of uh, define it. Let's look at key characteristics or components of the dominant or the imperial or King Kong presidency. Well, one key, character, one key characteristic is excessive concentration of powers. Uh, in the presidency, and that can that can be by constitutional design and or uh, statutory design, where, where you give the president uh, sweeping powers. Uh, so that's one 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 characteristic. The, the second characteristic, then, is, which is linked to the first, is because the presidency has sweeping powers. The presidency then tends to intrude into the functions of the other two branches both the judicial and the uh, executive branches uh, sort of undermine their capacity uh, to be able to exercise those functions uh, uh, well. The third is the, the lack of accountability. And the lack of accountability is the result of the fact that because the dominant presidency has excessive powers that enables it to then intrude into the functions of the other two branches, it makes it for those two branches to keep the dominant presidency in check. I mean, we could go on if you want, but I would say those are those are three major elements of the dominant presidency. Ladies and gentlemen, we want to say welcome to Focus on Liberia. This is in commemoration of Black History Month, and we are discussing Liberian history. Today, we are talking about the imperial presidency or the dominant presidency or the hegemonic presidency. My guest is Dr. George Clay Kier. He's here with a professor of history at the uh, Uni University of uh, Southern Texas University in Houston, Texas. D Dr. Kier, uh, let's go into the history. When, when this when this started, this dominant presidency, when it started, and how has it become dominant over time? I know maybe things started slowly, and now it becomes dominant over time. L let's go into the history. Yeah, yeah, if you permit me, Dennis, just before we, we uh, as part of the historical discussion, let me let me make one uh, quick comment. Um, prior to 1904, which is the which is the, the watershed moment, and 1904 is important in Liberian history and Liberian presidential history in particular, because that was when the that was when the national legislature enacted 
what is known as the Barclay Plan. And the Barclay Plan was a was a was a, a blueprint that was designed by the administration of President Arthur Barclay. And that plan had a number of key elements. And one of the central elements, of course, was to make the presidency a dominant entity in the administration of the country. Although the plan focused specifically on presidential control of the hinterland, because in our history, it was not until around the early 1900s that the Liberian, that the Liberian state was able to expand its territory. Prior to that time, Liberia as a country was rather limited because most of the, in fact, I would say all of the interior of Liberia was run by independent uh, uh, ethnic polities, macro states, if you will. Uh, they had their own systems that had basically ran their own societies free from central government control. So the Barclay Plan was the, then the combination of the effort after the Liberian state were over the, the hinterland and expand the territory uh, and the president said then uh, decided that it was going to set up an administrative system uh, that's how the department of the interior got created what we're going to call the ministry of internal affairs got uh, got created that the minister of internal affairs will sort of will be the president's representative in controlling paramount chiefs clan chiefs district commissioners all of those folks would then report to the president through the Minister of Internal Affairs. Prior to 1904, uh, right. with the, as I described before, with the, uh, with the uh, multitude of macro states we had, the presidency of Liberia were really not that strong, and that was by design, uh, because uh, Liberia at that time was really known for having a number of independent business people who worship. So they really they have much interest in government, in serving in government. If if they if the service saw it basically as uh, for a short term to render service to their country and then they will go back to their business ventures. So that's why even during that period the term of office of the president was only two years. Because the presidency was very not seen as a dominant institution in the affairs of the country. Then, he, he, of course, over time, those Liberian businesses began to fall out due to foreign competition. And they did not undertake the necessary strategies to be able to address uh, the problem of foreign competition, meaning from European firms. So most of those businesses collapsed. And then the government became the central employer beginning mm -hmm. 1869. And with the yeah. government becoming the central employer, the presidency then started getting very powerful because the president then who said who controlled the share of the government. The Barclay only yeah. institutionalized uh, uh, what we know today as this imperial presidency. So uh, yeah. in brief, that's that's yeah. that's the historical context in which the, the imperial presidency emerged. Okay, that, Dr. Kia, and you, you let, let's go back to that period prior, you said uh, you have businesses and the presidency was like two years and a lot of people were not, you know, this was not a, a place to go and get uh, power and wealth. So give me an example. So I, you, you were saying from Joseph Jenkins Roberts all the way to uh, before Barclay, where they themselves business people as well, or because the business sector was employing more so people really didn't have much interest in the presidency uh, explain that one little bit more well, well yeah they 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 not the largest employer the largest employer was the private sector and that private sector was dominated mainly by thriving and prosperous liberian business people who, who were involved in shipping agriculture a variety of sectors of the economy so uh, the government was really not seen as a place where someone would go to get rich. I mean, as that mindset then developed later. Uh, it was seen as an opportunity to render service to your country for a limited time, and then you move, you, you, you go back to your business. So, but once those businesses, as I said, began to collapse, 
in the face of foreign competition, particularly European competition. And those businesses did not develop the requisite strategies to respond to that competition, and they began to collapse. The government mm -hmm. then became the largest employer, and that helped to increase the power of the president because the president, mm -hmm. the president, you know, presides over the public bureaucracy. That bureaucracy mm -hmm. began to grow as people were now employed in different. And so the president's capacity to appoint people to various government positions to increase the powers of the presidency. Barclay just basically institutionalized that plan in his Barclay plan. Mm -hmm. so, some examples of those are businesses and individuals that were involved that, that are, do you have some examples? Well, yeah, I mean, you, you, I mean, without getting into the specifics of names, uh, you have various Liberian companies. Okay. Some are involved in the production and sale of camwood. Some are involved in the uh, production and sale of coffee. Uh, some are involved in the, in the, uh, in, the in the shipping business. Uh, so you, you you had a number of in a in a of, of sectors. So you you had a lot yeah. of like prosperous Liberian uh, mm -hmm. uh, 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 companies that then mm -hmm. in, in turn employ uh, a number of Liberians. Th th so, thank you. Uh, what is someone what, that I'm... Joseph Jenkins Roberts? Go ahead. No, I said you no. Know, you, you can continue because what that is important to me is uh, we started hearing about companies, you know, maybe from Firestone. So really to hear that there were prosperous librarian like, firms and businesses and individuals, that's new to me. Oh yeah, long before fire. Long, in fact, that's why a number of them objected to the Firestone contract. Uh, Louis Arthur Graham, who was the Attorney General of Liberia under Charles D.B. King when the Firestone contract was drawn, basically advised the president to reject the contract. Because Graham's came from that mindset that Liberians were capable of running the economy. And you read it in the intrusive uh, premium called Firestone to already come in. Because some people that Graham's uh, as I said, well, the mindset that, you know, that Liberians could revive their businesses and Liberian entrepreneurship could be the engine for social economic development in the country. But of course, uh, uh, President King was really not, not, not interested in that. And that's how uh, Firestone came in. And then when, when, when President Todman became president in, uh, in 1944 and came with the open door policy, something we'll discuss later on, that 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 particularly undermined uh, Liberian local entrepreneurship because it turned the entire economy in the direction of depending on foreign investors. Thank you. So it started, uh, you said 1904 with the Barclay plan. So the Barclay plan, you said institutionalized. Yeah. So it means to me that uh, it became part of the constitution, you say it's by design or the act of the legislature. So let's discuss is institutionalizing the uh, the dominant presidency, little more. What okay, so in 1904, Barclay came up with this plan. Yeah, so he came up with this plan for the administrative organization of the hinterland, which are actually, as we all know, the hinterland really constitute the bulk of the country. So mm -hmm. Barclay came up with a plan and said, this is how I want the hinterland to be organized. The administrative structure of the hinterland will consist of town chiefs, clown chiefs, Parma chiefs, and then district commissioners. We didn't have superintendents then. District commissioners. Those district commissioners will supervise the town chiefs, clan chiefs, and Parma chiefs, and they will report to the Secretary of the Interior, who is not the Minister of Internal Affairs. The mm. Minister of Internal Affairs will meet as the President. So the national legislature then passed that act, that Barclay Plan of 1904. So the institutionalization of the dominant presidency uh, really had its roots in terms of being institutionalized in that particular statute that was passed by the legislature. And then over time, the president, the constitution itself got amended and began contributing to increasing the powers of the president. 
But the 1904 statue came first. So, so it started. So, my, my next question is: now, now we, um, now we know. I first want to know because it started with Barclay, and then how did it grow? Did, did it get dominant over time, or has it become bigger or smaller yes. as time went by? It's, if I am much, much bigger, much, much bigger, because as the Constitution got amended. The Constitution got amended, and so uh, the expansion of presidential powers now became even constitutional. Let's take one of them, the president's powers of appointment. As the government grew bigger, what that meant is that the president had more people to appoint. Are you following me? Yeah. So as the government expanded, because the government now became the major employer, so as that government became bigger, adding ministries and agencies and all of that requiring uh, 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 leaders to run them, it increased the powers of the presidency. Yeah. So the president now, even if you go look at the local level, assistant superintendents, ministers, deputy ministers, assistant ministers, director generals, so as the as the as the scope and size of the government is said increase, so did the the imperial presidency or the King Kong presidency to use your app phrase. So it happened over time. So Barclay, yeah. so Barclay, uh, uh, King, the other Barclay, and then of course Tutman. The Tottenham presidency was, I would call that, the second phase of the massive expansion of the powers of the presidency. Because it was Tottenham that really expanded the government bureaucracy. Then Tottenham and further expanded the government bureaucracy. And one of the things that President Tottenham, he created more ministries and he created And that meant increasing presidential appointed powers. Right. Then, Dr. Kia, we lost you, know, you a little bit when you said President President Tudbert created more ministries because we we're talking about the expansion. So I lost you there when you said from President Tudbert. So please uh, repeat that about President Tudbert. Yeah, so President Tudbert came in, he created more ministries, and then he created a lot of public corporations. So that meant, and all those people had to be appointed by the president. Right. So that increased the president's appointive powers. And then he left. The coup happened. President Doe comes in. Doe expands the little bit, added a few ministries. And then, of course, President Taylor, he came in. He added a few. President Salif came in. She maintained that structure and expanded the presidential appointive powers, but now the power to appoint mayors. Because mayors, the, the mayors of cities prior to President Salif were elected. Even under the one party rule, under the true party, even if we make the argument that those elections were symbolic, we still had elections for mayor. But President Salif. President Salif, uh, on her presidency, the president was given the power to appoint city mayor, something that was very contentious and remained contentious today. And when that case, is, when that case went to court, it was the, the Liberty Party. The Liberty Party that filed a suit with the with the president's authority to appoint city mayors and the Supreme Court and the president had the authority to appoint city mayors. The president of Liberia as it stands now means virtually everyone who works in the executive branch uh, and everyone who works in the judicial branch. Thank you. Let's so go the, to only, the, uh, the, only, the only branch where the president doesn't have appointed powers 
if for the House of Representatives, I mean, the legislative branch, the House of Representatives, and the uh, and the Senate. Right. So a, a, a point of power means you have more people reporting to you, you have more people who are at your will and pleasure. So let's go. Let's go to the effect of this dominant presidency. Is it a good thing or bad thing, or what has been the impact? Well, I would I, I say, on the whole, as someone who has studied the phenomena, I will make the argument that uh, it, it has not really have positive results. And let me and let me let me make let me make the case what I why I think so. Uh, one one major effect is that. It places too many government officials service at the will and the pleasure of the president. Because the president can dismiss them at will without providing any justification. So that's one problem. That problem then contributes to a second problem, which means that people do not have security of job tenure. Because since they are appointed by the president, they don't know when the president might get up on the wrong side of his or bed and decide to fire them. So there's no job security. The third effect is that then that promotes sycophancy. So people are more sycophantic uh, than principal uh, because they, they, are, they are fearful that if they, gave the, if they gave an advice that the president does not like, they could be fired. The fourth major negative effect is that that then makes it very difficult for competent Liberians who might want to serve their country to serve in those positions because they do not want to leave their job security in the hands of the whims and caprices of the president. And, and, and this is not just only true, uh, Dennis, for you and your viewers for political positions in the public bureaucracy. It's even true for our schools. The president of Liberia appoints the president of the University of Liberia and all of the presidents of all the public universities we have in the, in the country, and he appoints principals of public high schools like BWI. Hmm. And Dr. Kia, people are saying that's where the legislature come in to serve as a check that's on, true. That, on, that, on that power. <laughs> That, that is that is true, but unfortunately, the legislature has been incapable of checking the president's powers. And let's keep and let's keep in mind too that, in fairness to the legislature, although the legislature has not been effective in keeping the president in check, the the uh, part of the the main problem of the uh, of the hegemonic presidency, going to the point I made before about it being institutionalized, is that the the constitution laws that have been passed by the legislature and even a supreme court ruling for this king kong presidency so the president can make the argument and say i have the legal to do what i'm doing be, be, and, and, and uh, let's go back and uh, because you're saying this king kong presidency is constitutional so the president is not breaking any law yes. by doing this. No, well, the president, the president stretches stretches the margins of uh, uh, at times, but the power to appoint all these people is constitutional. If you go from Article Fifty Two of the current Constitution, there's a long list of people the president can appoint, including notary publics, bailiffs, sheriffs, and all these people are appointed by the president. And, and although uh, Paramount Chiefs, go ahead. No, I, I said, no, continue continue your thought because what I was going to ask is, uh, so it means we need what I put in conclusion, uh, quotation, a good president. And, and that will lead to this thing called benevolent dictatorship, right? Because we say if the president can have all this appointive power, so it means if the president is good, everything's going to be good. Is that an argument to make? If the president well, is well, looking for all of but us, but our caution, we don't want to put our faith in individuals. Okay. Well, why that might be true, Dennis, the, the, caution, the caution is that I will argue that 
we don't want to put our faith in a good president. We want to put our faith in good laws and good institutions. So, uh, still on the effect is the, the question that I put on the screen there. Uh, the operations of the government of Liberia, how has the dominant presidency of, uh, affected the operations of the GOL? Maybe we can make the argument that uh, it, it makes things... Uh, All right, let, it, that's it, that's it. Go ahead. That's Your an excellent question. Let's take personnel. Yeah. Uh, can you hear me now? Okay, let's take personnel. Looking at the effect on the operation of GOL, let's take the question of personnel. If you give the president this kind of expensive power to appoint virtually every official in the executive branch and in the judicial branch, what that means is that the president could appoint incompetent and unqualified people. That's one negative effect. Now, it's also possible that the president could appoint quality. So it could, it, it, it could, it, it. so the president could, could, could competent, qualify and competent people, or the president could do the opposite. So that, that's one. Okay. The second problem talking about personnel is job security. Uh, will, will qualified and competent Liberians be willing? to take positions in which they cannot freely exercise their expertise for fear that they might anger the president, the president might fire them. Yeah. So, so Dr. Kier, all that being said, so when we say the day-to-day -day running of the government, if the president has all this power, will it make things uh, 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 faster? Because you don't have to go through all this bureaucracy of uh, check and balances, you have the power, so meaning, and you said that earlier that we don't want to put our faith in one person, but would the operation be smoother because you don't have too many, uh, too many things to, 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 to bother with. It's just one person doing all this. Will we have fast, faster operations? Well, I'm not sure whether, yeah, I'm not sure whether that might even, I mean, one may make an argument and say, well, yeah, uh, it might lead to faster operation, but we also need to ask the question, will it make the government more efficient and effective? But more broadly, uh, is that the kind of country we have where we have a single president making those kinds of decisions? So, so now the, uh, the, the effect we're talking about, let's look at uh, democracy, our quest for democracy and also national development this dominant presidency, what the impact there will be? Ladies and gentlemen, if you are just joining us, this is Focus on Liberia. We are discussing... If you give the president... Dr. Kia, we are losing you. Let, let's try again. Well, I don't, hmm. First, your I voice can hear you clearly, in. Dennis. You, can you hear me clearly? Very clearly, loud and clear. Right, but when, when your voice is coming in, it's, it's kind of becoming choppy and sometimes it's delayed. So go again. Okay. Let me come. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you now. Yeah, I don't know why it's happening. I don't know why it's happening, Dennis. I mean, you, you, you the expert at technology, so I don't know what I don't know what's happening. But at least I'm I'm looking at everything here. They they, they seem to be fine. Okay, now your voice is clear. Let, let's go back. You know about the operation we're talking about. 
Okay. All right. So let's take democracy. Yeah. If you give that amount of power to one person, you're setting that person up to be a detector. Because as the famous adage goes, power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. And let's keep in mind humans and any human beings who have check powers may have the temptation to be dictatorial. So the expensive presidential appointive powers then makes it easier for the president to manipulate the other two branches of government because part of that expensive power is the president's control of the country's purse. So the, the president controls the, the public's money. And although, and although constitutionally the national legislature uh, is supposed to provide checks on the president in terms of how government money gets spent and that to be spent within the confine approved budget and the president wants to spend additional money the president has to go to the legislature for approval that is not what we have experienced in our recent history so the president then can even use the very money to corrupt the legislature itself so if the president wanted to appoint person x and the members of the legislature object the president could give them white envelopes to silence them. Or if the president wanted a particular concession agreement, going to the development side, say, I want us to sign this contract with so-so-so company, and some member of the legislature uh, uh, object, the, the president could use money, his, money, his or her control over the public purse as a corrupting influence. And that's why I think it's very important that the legislature, not just in theory, but in practice. Th thank you. So you you all you you mentioned that this mainly or uh, it became institutionalized from uh, President Barclay. So from President Barclay up to present, mm -hmm. you, and you 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 also mentioned how each succeeding uh, president. Can I increase that or expand that power? But the the whole idea of this imperial presidency and the the cries against it has always been there. So walk me through attempts that have been put into place or that have been done to kind of slow this expansion down or to bring this uh, presidential power or uh, the hegemonic or the King Kong presidency in, in check. What has been the history trying to uh, fight it or control it? That's 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 another good question, Dennis. When when the Constitution was drafted in 1984, uh, the hope by many uh, was that that would provide us an opportunity, uh, not only to change a lot of things constitutionally, but that would provide an opportunity to cage this King Kong president to use your app, your app phrase, uh, your app phrase. But unfortunately, the, the 1984 constitution, which became the 1986 constitution, did not do that. And so that was a really a missed opportunity. The 1986 constitution, in fact, kept the King Kong presidency intact. In and then after we had the first Liberian Civil War, we had another opportunity for constitutional reform. We didn't do that. Then after our second civil war prior to the 2005 election, we had another opportunity and we did not do that. Then President Salif came in, appointed a constitutional reform commission that did a study, came up with a report and nothing was done about that report. So yes, uh, there, there have been moments when we've had the opportunity uh, to reform the presidency, 
but we have not taken advantage of those moments. Why? Well, because there has been no political will. We've had no political will. So, for example, I mean, link to the hegemonic presidency or the King Kong presidency, and uh, and, uh, and I'm Dennis, Dennis, I'm really going to steal it from you. Link yeah. to the King Kong presidency uh, is the problem of long term. The president is president for six years. Six years. And two terms, that's 12 years. That's too long. So, so the the, the, so the if we want to go ahead, no, go, go ahead. ahead and your thought, and your thought before I ask. No, no, no. I, I want to say that if we if we're going to reform the presidency, it has to be in totality, the term mm -hmm. of office and the president's powers. Yeah. My last question before we go to that to the reforms now and how we can cage this dominant presidency is uh. You, you talk about the will, you say the political willpower. That willpower on the, on the part of whom? Is it the president? The, the I mean, will, who will agree to the take away the power? The administrations that have run the... Because you know very well the, the way the amendment process is set up in our constitution to, to, to cash the King Kong presidency is going to require the support of the national legislature first, okay. because we need a two we need two third majority in the Senate, two third majority in the House before it goes to a referendum. Well, so the will the will power too should be on the part of the uh, the citizens. Have we become well, yeah, so the citizens, or, or, yeah, yeah, so. The citizens will have to pressure their government or our government to make those changes. Let's go to the reforms. Because because level with the politicians. Yeah. Go, go ahead. No, go ahead. Level with the politicians, what happened? They enjoy it, right? It's sweet. Well, well that's the problem. I mean, you, you're asking senators and saying, well, approve, approve reducing your term of office for nine years. You're asking member of the House reduce your term of office from six years. And a number of them are really not willing. And that's why the referendum we just had on that question was don't have assets. And we saw the results. Okay. If you are just joining us, this is focused on Liberia. In commemoration of Black History Month, we are discussing Liberian history. In today's topic, we are talking about the history, the effect of the dominant presidency and how we can reform it. My guest is Dr. Josh Clay here. He's a professor of political science at Southern Texas University and also a professor at, of international relations at the AME University in Monrovia. Dr. Kia, let's go to the reforms. How can we cage this Kikon presidency? And that's another excellent question, uh, Dennis. We really going to need to mobilize the citizenry. I mean, uh, 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 on this one, I will put the onus on us as citizens of Liberia to take the lead in uh, exerting the pressure to cage the presidency. Uh, so that, that I would say that needs to be the driving force. Now, in specific terms, we need to review the constitution and review the statutes. Uh, as the next step then of making a decision in the context of separation of powers and checks and balances, which are the final pillows of our presidential system, what will be the appropriate amount of powers for the president? I mean, that, that's the question I would suggest that needs to drive that whole process of caging the King Kong presidency. What will be yeah. What would be the appropriate power? So let me let me take a stab by it. Let's take the president's appointive powers. I will make the argument that one, any position that is below an assistant minister. Well, let me let me let me take one step backward. We need to create a situation in Liberia where we make a distinction 
um, uh, between political appointees and people who get their jobs on merit, whether through competitive exams or competitive interviews. So we need to have two classes of employees in our public sector. Those who are political appointees and those who are appointed based on merit. Those who are political appointees, yeah, when a new administration comes in, that new administration can change all of them. But those who got their job on merit, the technocrats, who already run our various ministries and agencies, need to have so many so that they basically can ensure that the administrative machinery of the government runs smoothly, irrespective of who the president is. So going back to the political appointees, I would suggest that any position below the assistant minister should be a merit-based position. So the president can appoint the minister, the deputy minister, the assistant minister. That's it. Any other position like director of human resources, director of procurement, or whatever the other jobs are, need to be made civil service job. And people need to get those jobs based on merit, their qualifications. Because those are the people who will run the administrative machinery of the government. So that that would be one that would be one suggestion. It's yeah, said go, that we got to get the presidency. Dr. Kier, before you go further on yes. this one, we, we say we've done that already. Uh, President Saleh, before he left, created those tenure positions. So you talk of tenure. So yeah, but those tenure that, positions. <laughs> yeah, but those tenure positions are not. They're not. Their tenure positions at the level of high level position, they're for commissions. I'm talking about tenure positions for civil servants. Nope. And, and you say from assistant ministers, I mean, maybe deputy ministers. Below the assistant minister, what? below the assistant minister, every other position in the public service should be a, a, a tenure civil service position that people get on the basis of qualifications. Thank you. The next one. The second one is in our educational system. If we competent Liberians to run our public educational system, we got to move the president from appointing high school principals for BWI and the president of the University of Liberia and Tottenham University and president of community colleges. The, the board of trustees of those universities need to go out conduct searches for the presidents of those universities and, and community colleges and high schools and select the best candidate based on qualification. Give those people a contract and that, that contract will be based on their performance. The president should have really no role in appointing uh, the leaders of our educational institutions because in so doing, uh, academic administration in public education in Liberia has been politicized. Because you don't know when the president might decide to fire you as president of the University of Liberia or fire you as president or fire you as president of a community college or fire as the principal of BWI. And you're not going to get qualified Liberians to risk their career to take a position in the educational sector that is subjected to the personal whims and caprices of the president. Uh, Dr. Kia, I, I like those suggestions, but to me, that is like we are tinkering at the edges. Why not take the bull by the horn and say de decentralizing state power? Oh, well, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I know it's our discussion for for next week, but even if we okay. decentralize state power, we need a personnel. I mean, we yeah. can extend that. Uh, a good you raised that because in 2012, I worked with the Commission of Liberia on the decentralization plan. We spent several months on working on it. If that was implemented, we, and that's about almost nine years ago now, we would be far mm -hmm. ahead. Under that plan, even county superintendents will be elected. That's another era of personnel. Contest superintendents will be will be elected. We will have a revenue sharing formula between the central government, uh, municipal government, and the county government. 
so that and which brings you your question too about development so that rather mm -hmm. than looking up to monrovia for everything including direction for development projects counties can independently undertake their own development projects so the superintendent of the county the assistant superintendent or person we call the chief development officer under the decentralized plan these you know the the chief development officer is appointed based on a i mean selected based on a search but the county superintendent is elected the mayor of the various cities are also elected if, if we can do that, we will take away a good chunk of the president's appointed powers. And going to my earlier point, if you say any, any position below the assistant minister is a protected civil service category, you have you, you have done a great job in substantially reducing the appointed powers of the King Kong presidency. Yeah. But we're not willing, but we're not willing to do that. That's the problem. So after we did all that work on the decentralization plan, it never got implemented. <laughs> Again, we go to the why, but I don't want us to sway away from, from our discussion. But what, what I'm about to say is uh, what we've seen over time is uh, we want the president to have more appointing power. We as citizens, because the president is coming from our political party and then the president winning, it will mean more job for us. So we don't want to limit the uh, this imperial yes. president. Even though we, we we blame the president when we when our party is not in position. Yes, yes, that's an excellent point, Dennis. Uh, but we got to do what is best for Liberia because I always make the argument that the president has the right, and that's why I may try to make the distinction, the need for the distinction between political appointees and ten-year civil servants. The president has the right to appoint political appointees. So let's say, okay, 10 or 15 percent of all government jobs will be political appointees. The president can appoint them. But the other 85 to 90 percent will be 10 year civil servant. Because the government of Liberia is for all Liberians, irrespective of their political, ethnic, and other kinds of affiliations. And every Liberian has the right to provide his or her service to her government, irrespective of whether that person is affiliated with the political party in power. Unless we develop that orientation and that mindset, uh, development and democracy will be very elusive for a very long time, unfortunately. And the point you made is absolutely correct. Uh, we see the presidency basically as, as the baboon who divides cola after the elections. <laughs> <laughs> so so we have two key takeaways to, tonight the Kikon presidency and now bamboo is dividing cola after the uh, election <laughs> the, 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 uh, the, the, the uh justice you know the supreme court here in the united states the president appoint all the justices right and so in liberia same thing but you know even though uh, uh president trump ex former president trump is an outlier but the pr president appointing all the justices that has worked over the years for the United States. But in the King Kong presidency, people make the argument, but that's the same. So why is it different? What well, the, the difference, the difference in in our system, and I'm glad you raised that question as well, Dennis. Uh, political institutions have to be informed by a political culture and by political culture i'm referring to the norms and values and generally the way in which people do things and those norms and values are based on some kind of societal agreement mm -hmm. you raise the question about the united states on the american political culture the expectation they require that although the president Appoints the judges of the Supreme Court and federal and, and judges of other. Those people are required to be independent. Yeah. But unfortunately, our Liberian political culture does not have that requirement. So, 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 so part of reforming the hegemonic presidency or the King Kong presidency has to be part and parcel of a larger pro process of reforming our entire political culture 
including the way in which we think and act about politics. Okay. And that's that's and a big I'm project. Asking. It's a big one. And I want to know how we can start that. But So that would be my last question before we go to our viewers' comments. You know, this whole orientation, you know, this whole thing that we talk about tonight, where do we start? We start from educating the citizens. We start from the president, you know, being a good president or qualify. Where do we start? Does it start with the political leader? Does it start with our legislators? Where can we begin as of today? In short, Dennis, I would say all of the above. We need all of those. I mean, you you you've described the approaches very well. We need all of them working in tandem. We need we need we need education. We need uh, political will on the part of our political leaders. We need citizens' participation and citizen pressure. So we need all of those things, all of the above. Let me bring in our our viewers with the with their comments. And we'll, we'll, we'll ask our our uh, control room in the back office to help us put some of these questions on the board so that Dr. Kia will describe will uh, respond to them. Uh, you have some goodwill out here. Jackie is watching. Pastor Patience, say welcome, Professor. Uh, you have Dr. Thank you. Salif say. Yeah, he's introducing himself. Good to hear from you, Dr. Salif. Good to hear good. from you. They lose long time. Yes, send a good to hear from you. And good to hear from you, my sister, Antoinette. The first question here comes from uh, Dave Ja. When we're talking about the businesses in, uh, before Barclays, were those businesses connected to slavery? Well, no, there's, there's really no, no historical evidence that they were, but they were, they were, if you call if you call that but they were certainly attached to uh uh some form of quasi uh, forced labor as well too because i mean uh the ordinary librarians who were working for those companies were not really getting justly compensated if one wants to call that slavery one could call right jackie is saying there was a librarian development Single company sense. dr salif said he believed those businesses included uh, a Adventure share tapping task collectors and other illegal businesses. That's that's true. That's true. Uh, Oliver Tolo, thanks, Doctor. I appreciate your contribution to our Labyrinth history, but I would like to recommend that you write a book and the Labyrinth history on the Labyrinth history to enable us know more about our country, but if you are in the process, amen to that. Before Dr. Kia came well, into we that, had, I said, yeah, test, we had uh, Oliver, we had a, we had a Liberia history project, unfortunately, uh, at, at, you know, that, that, you know, that we didn't really proceed with that project, but you, you are absolutely right. We need to revive that project. We need it, uh, we certainly need a Liberia history project. But I've, uh, I've, I've, I've in my own in my own way, as my sister Jackie Sai is pointing out, I've in my own little two cents worth uh, I made some contributions in that direction. There's a there's a recent book that I edited called Liberia in the 21st Century. You can get that on Amazon. It deals with some of these issues as well. In fact, in that volume, I have three chapters on the Liberian state and uh, democracy in the country as well, too. So I mean, you know, so you can take a look at that. But in the broader scheme of things. Uh, we definitely need a, a book on, on Liberia history. And as I said, although that project uh, did not materialize during the Salif administration, mm -hmm. we certainly need to revive it. We definitely need a book on, yeah. on, on, on Liberia, a comprehensive text on Liberian yeah. history. And, and uh, my answer to that too is uh, we don't really have to, there are still bits and pieces around. For instance, uh, the Liberian Study Journal, they have a lot of materials in there. They are a lot of yes. uh, Correct. Other Liberian historians and uh, uh, people, professionals writing books. So let's begin from somewhere. Let's start reading what we have already. Well, that's Focus true. Liberia, we, we that's very true. Uh, uh, these yeah, Dr. Okay. Boros, Dr. Carl Boros wrote a book on uh, uh, on uh, Between the uh, Polar Forest and the so called pre-modern pre -modern, pre modern Liberian history. So that's a that's a that's a good starting point as well. I mean, he gives. Uh, 
he gives us uh he gives he gave us that will give us uh, a good sense of uh you know how liberia was developing before even 1847. yeah now i'm reading the comment here that i'm reading the comment here about about blaming us of not running for position in national legislature uh, to keep a check on the president and say okay i mean uh, that's fair I, I i take the criticism right you say i blame dr kia dr sawyer and others for the imperial presidency if people like dr kia had run for a position in the legislature they will keep a check on the presidency and uh dr kia had run for the presidency before so i don't know if you will still blame him uh or well as I, as I said Chris, criticism well put and 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 i i accept yeah amara vitore i like the fact that dr kia mentioned that the massive presidential appointment breeds sick offensive this is obvious in today's labyrinth politics oh yes uh, amara has a long long history yeah uh, okay Question here for Jackie Sire. Would librarians have voted for an accomplished academic over an incompetent who threw money their way? Why was this accomplished dean of a top rated university not appointed president of the University of Liberia? The answer Imperial Presidency. That's yeah, so Jackie's analysis. Well, Jackie, I, Jackie, him into that. I have no further comment to make. You describe him much better than I could myself. Thank you, Jackie. Mm -hmm. All right. Does this mean that because of the wide range of power of the presidency, this then leads to institutionalization of corruption, nepotism, and favoritism? That's the question from Frank Weller. That's correct, uh, Frank Lee, uh, 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 That that my brother Frank Weller. That uh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, the president has control over the purse, so the president can corrupt the legislature and the judiciary itself. And the nepotism and favoritism part is the president can appoint literally whoever he wants or she wants. Yeah, so Martin it needs to corrupt, said, it contributes to that. Uh, from 2003 to 2006, and 2000, there was the greatest opportunity under the free government, I think, when I asked the question, you know, where, whether there were some attempts to uh, do something about this imperial presidency. Mohammed yeah, Sabia, I mean, uh, uh, it's, it's... Go ahead. Go ahead, go ahead, Beth Dennis. Mohammed Sadia Dukla said, unfortunately, the citizen can't do much at this stage unless through a concerted reorientation effort. We're talking about caging the imperial presidency. What's Amen to that. Amen to that, Mohammed. You're absolutely right. Right on point. Amen. Uh, Dr. Saki Golafale. My question to Dr. Kia, do you think that Labra is one of the black men's success stories? Why black Americans or African Americans do not consider Liberia as part of the Black History Month celebration. Well, I, 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 that's a good question, uh, and and uh, at least from my vantage point, particularly here working at a at a black university, um, is the is the issue of the, the the lack of information, the lack of knowledge about about Liberia's role, uh, even African American life, and and we're trying to help correct that. We have a series now. Uh, that, that we just did one section on Liberia, we're going to do that in a number of African countries to help educate African Americans uh, about the role of countries in Liberia in the whole, in the totality of the of the Black experience in this country. So that's an excellent point. Uh, Emmanuel Jackson said, when you ran for president in 2005, you said it was necessary to prosecute all corruption in Liberia from 1971 to the current dispensation. Are you still committed to that endeavor? Jackson is taking well, out I, of, I, 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 Good question, Emmanuel. I, I believe that's the only way we're going to end the culture of impunity because if we just allow people to see the Liberian government as an opportunity to come in, enrich themselves, enrich their friends and families, people, nothing happens to them, they're not held accountable, uh, that is never going to end. And it got to end somewhere. And the way to end is, is to hold people responsible. Absolutely. Willie DeLong said, we need a system that takes our traditional culture into consideration and also one that affords upward mobility and economics as well as social opportunities for the masses and not specific group. Amen, 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 fully agreement. 
Manendo, Dr. Kier, how do you view the current crop of political parties and their abilities to contribute to reforming a decadent political culture? A decadent political culture. That, that's an excellent question, Jake Manen. Uh, 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 you and I have had this discussion over the many, many years. My, my, my hope and wish is that the political party play a role, but as you know, given the nature of political parties in our country, which which is will be require a whole show by itself, uh, they are really not in that position to uh, to be able to make that contribution. I hope they can. In fact, because there will be there will be a, a major major force in making the kinds of changes uh, in reforming our decadent political culture, but. Uh, Unfortunately, as you know, and I know our parties are not in the position to do that, but they can and they should. Let's talk about the history of that. That brings another one. What has been the role of uh, political parties in, again, caging this uh, imperial presidency? All political parties are just waiting their turn to benefit from the Kikon presidency. Some of them have tried. I mean, I gave the I gave the Liberty Party a tremendous amount of credit because it challenged the president's authority to appoint mayors. So, so the Liberty Party was the political party that took that case to the Supreme Court. And so I, I applaud that effort. It's going to take more of that of those kinds of efforts uh, to be able to case the King Kong presidency. So that was a laudable strike. But we're not going to make the desired impact just by you know, one case here and one case there. It, it got to be, as, as one of your viewers said before, part and parcel of a much broader, concerted effort. Yeah, but... Uh, and so... Let's, let's, yeah, let's even and, and so what I would mean then is that is that political part, political parties will be, have to be committed to the broader national project beyond just their own narrow policy interests. Let's go back further and see uh, the history of, again, political parties doing something in that direction. Let's go back to uh, under President Turbot, President Doe, uh, President Turbot, we don't expect much, but let's go into that history. But we had a we had a history of strong political parties in like until 1955. Liberia, Liberia from 1847 to 1955 had a history of strong political parties that checked the powers of the presidency to some extent. I mean, there was a legendary legislator that widowed spoon from Sino, T.J. Ira Faulkner, who ran uh, on the uh, on the People's Party against C.D.B. King twice. So, so there was we've had strong political parties in Liberia, but when President Todman came in 1955 and had that crackdown, where he arrested and imprisoned the leaders of a number of the opposition political parties forced people like D2A into exile, and then the True Way Party sort of became this de facto party, and that stayed with us, and that stayed with us for most of our, most of our national history. So we, we, we've, uh, we, 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 we have things that we can go back and learn. We've had a history of strong political parties in Liberia. Dr. Admet K. Salif, saying, understanding statecraft, Training our people in matters of state building and understanding instruments of state power as well as state capabilities are essential prima for mental leadership in Liberia. I fully agree. And that's that's that gotta be part of what Dennis and I were discussing before. It gotta be part of restructuring our political culture. Absolutely, you're absolutely correct, Brother Salif. Uh Sam Wallow, the president can appoint whoever he or she wants. But an independent and serious legislature can stop unqualified nominees and demand better nominees. The legislators need to better understand their role. Amen. But amen. But we but we know but we know the legislature role is mediated by the presidential way envelope. And so uh, as long as legislators who are willing to come as uh, performing that. Uh, will be very difficult and, they, and you're absolutely correct brother Wolo. they have the constitutional power to do it they just they just that they've not exercised it for a variety of reasons yeah oh i, I was i had the uh, privilege to interview senator the newly elected senator from river g jonathan subway aka boy charles 
He said when he got to the uh, Senate, he asked for a copy, a signed copy of the budget, and he couldn't find it. He had to take him two yeah. weeks or more. He even went on a national radio before they gave him a copy. So I'm, I was wondering, hmm, if the budget that has been passed and signed, if you can't get the copy, I wonder what they're using to 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 actually monitor the budget and make sure that is the money you know appropriated is being used for the internal purpose. But again, we go back to the legislature. Let's look at yeah, exactly. Right. But that that tells you then. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Make your comment. No, no, no. I want to say quickly. Say, I mean, yeah, a uh, uh, board transport that well. I mean, he's a sitting senator. And so that tells you that the legislature really doesn't exercise any oversight over how public funds are spent. Mentusla W. Doe, how possible is it that is it when Labro got independence by ACS that aborted slavery and Black History Month doesn't include Liberia? In other words, with the same question on uh, Liberia and Black History Month, that uh, how come? that uh, this connection is not really being emphasized in, during the celebration of Black History Month. And that's where what? you should give credit to focus on Liberia for discussing Liberia history during Black History Month. Go ahead, Dr. Absolutely. Absolutely. Is the lack of, yeah, you know what Dennis said, yeah, you have a great role of focus on Liberia, of knowledge. It, it, that's absolutely a lack of knowledge on the part of uh, African-American brothers and sisters who really don't know Liberia's role. And so we got to help educate them. Yeah. It's incumbent upon all of us. You were concerned about the long tenure. The presidency tenure was four years in the past. How was it upgraded to six? Was this actually done constitutionally? Yes. Uh, the, 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 19, the drive 1984 constitution had four years for the president. But then the Constitutional Assembly changed that four years to six years. And that six years of what was passed in the referendum uh, in uh, in July 1984. So it was done constitutionally, yes. But but another thing to mention is uh, I don't know which constitution you're referring to, but the presidency was two years, which was later changed, I think, to four years. And then I think the last uh, amendment yeah. that President Pablo made was to have it for eight years or two consecutive terms of. Four years and then you don't you don't you don't run again. Yes. Yeah, so Todd, Todd Moore made it the first term eight years and then unlimited four year terms. And then Todd <laughs> Moore made it eight years for first term and two limited four year terms. And then the nineteen eighty four draft constitution, the commission that the Sawyer led, have four years for the president, two limited or two terms. The Constituent Assembly led by the late Dr. Edward Kesley changed that to six years for the president, six years for the House, nine years for the Senate. And that was what we passed in the referendum we had. To, to, and the fact that to, we have not been able to change that since then. We've not been so able to change that since then. Sorry, Dr. Kia, sometimes your voice breaks in, so then I think you complete. Please what, end your they, thought. They, we've not read it. No, what I was saying was, no, we haven't been able to change that. I mean, President Salib, as I said, appointed a constitutional review commission that was headed by former Chief Justice Gloria Scott. Uh, they did the work and all of that, but, you know, it never got, um, it never got implemented. So the last effort to change that was the recent referendum that tried to change the president term from six to nine years and senators from nine to seven and members of the house from uh, six to five, which is still very long. Dr. Dr. Samuel To, you know, wrote a, wrote a piece on the uh, Tudman presidency and said the fact that those things that Tudman put into place, we've not been able to change them, I'm paraphrasing, Meaning that uh, Tudman had a profound impact on the, uh, the on Liberia, and in turn, it means Tudman policies were were good. That's why you can change it because you are enjoying it. So, what, what's your take? <laughs> well, well Tudman, Tudman, as the King Kong president, uh, you know, 
with a massive security network at his disposal, uh, harass and suppress his political opponent. So he pretty much, and then and then under the ages of the de facto one party system, he could pretty much do whatever he wanted to do. <laughs> Dr. Batum Kula said, that, you know, uh, 1955 to 1980 is only 25 years of uh, one party TWP. Is, is that what you say? I, I don't think so. Go, go ahead, Dr. Kia, and respond to that. Well, yeah, yeah. I mean, Todd instituted the de facto one party rule. Yeah, so, so, so Dr. Kula is correct. Yeah, it's lasted for 25 years under the coup. Right. So before before Tadman, that was still the TWP, but you were saying it was now one party. Well, well, before Tadman, we had a TWP, but a TWP of, was one of several major political parties. Okay. Emmanuel Jackson is, uh, is, a, is the current political economy rent seeking the influence of the dominant presidency and how can we change or reform to an employment creating economy well that's that's a that's another excellent question um with all of the natural resources that we have uh one of the pathways we need to consider is industrialization so for example i said that we produce all that rubber where firestone does not produce tires and other rubber products in the country so those are things we need to start considering because if we can if we can add value to the raw materials we produce, that will really help us in creating the kind of employment economy that Brother Jackson is talking uh, talking about. That would be one way. We, we need to use our vast natural resources, uh, add value to them, and to create pro uh, products. And one of the ways in which that can be done is through industrialization. And, and, and I mean, country that South I, Korea were in worst, worst economic position when they became... Uh, when they became uh, independent, they don't really have natural resources like we have. But I mean, look at countries like South Korea and Singapore today. And, and what is this political or uh, political economy or rent seeking? Well, rent seeking is basically what Brother Jackson is saying that all we're doing is rely, we are relying on from our natural resources. So, Firestone pay the government taxes or royalties for uh, the, uh, the, a seller metal pays the government taxes or royalties for iron ore. Basically, rent, we're collecting rent. That's all. We, that's what we're doing. Mm. So, Dr. Saki Golafale, who is a PhD in chemistry, say, "Don't you think we should consider a science-driven economy?" I fully agree with you. In fact, science is indispensable to industrialization, as you know, Doc. So, amen to that. Will you say something about the dichotomy between the American mentality or leadership ethos of our early Labrin leaders versus the sub-Saharan African leadership ethos or the desires for self-rule at the time in early Liberia? The uh, oh, amen. You're making a big the, the English half of for <laughs> did that syncretism help or hurt us going forward? Well, yes. I mean, it did. I mean, you're absolutely right because they they were they were conflicted by what they saw in the United States, uh, and then over time, what they what they what they saw in independent Africa. So, uh, 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 Brother Salim, on the one hand, uh, they came from a country, although on a on a horrendous conditions in which, at least, the mentality that the leadership ethos, as you refer to it, that was developing at that time. Uh, uh, was to have accountable leaders who are democratic and all of that, and then they go to Africa and over time, post-independent Africa produces uh, leaders basically who are already moving the other way. So uh, uh, the the combinations of those two minds we have. Let me read two more comments and then we're going to be uh, concluding this. Alexander Patu Kwe. Black Americans need to connect to their um, African roots. We are talking, uh, referencing Liberia in the Black History Month, but those Black Americans that are advocating for Black history are advocating for themselves. Black Americans and not Blacks as a race from a continent that has suffered so much 
Western superiority? Well, yeah, but I would say all of them. I mean, some of them. I mean, yes, uh, as them. I mentioned in response to one question before, uh, the the black Americans in the Houston community where I am now, when we had that program on Liberia, the attendance was very good. They were very receptive to learning more about Liberia. So yeah, I mean, you're right that there are some of them who do, but you know, that's not peculiar to them. I mean, we we'll have that uh, in many places. Some people want to subscribe to the more broader uh, African and other people like America. And, and to what extent has we, uh, Liberia, especially Liberians of the uh, black, black or uh, African American descent, okay, or the uh, the who came of settlers. I think to what extent can you can you say uh, we have not done so well in in kind of reinforcing that connection, right? In Liberia now, probably since the coup, in my personal interaction, many American Liberians. In fact, when you say that word, it's, you you're being accused of being divisive. But that is part of our history. American Liberians exist. They came from America and they settled in Liberia or they, they returned. So that part of our history exists. But because of the uh, the uh, the way we perceive it, we don't want to address that because we perceive it or we talk about it from a divisive standpoint. So what I've observed is many American Liberians do not publicly claim the American Liberian roots. They will either say, oh, I'm Pele, or I'm from Pele. Oh, if you call me American Liberian, it means you are segregating against me. So because of that, we have not been able to connect to our African-American brothers or talk about that route more openly so that we can make use of that history and get that connection crystallized. Well, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, you're absolutely right. That is a, is a, and that's one of the, and that's one of the issues we, we have to, we have to correct. Liberia itself is a cultural mosaic, and I've always argued yeah. that what that, that what makes up Liberia is are five cultural streams. You mentioned the 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 Africans who left the United States and went to Liberia, who are the so-called American Liberians. That's one strain. The Congos who never who are who are, who are uh, liberated in route to slavery. That's a second strain. African ethnic groups that migrated as the empires and others collapsed and moved to the area called Liberia, that's string number three. String number four are Africans who came from the Caribbean. And string number five are Africans who came from other parts of Africa, like Nigeria, Sierra Leone, and Togo. So those are our five major cultural strains. And there's nothing divisive in admitting that that's the reality of history. We all, we all, whether we come from any one of those five strains, we all came from somewhere and met in Liberia. Our critical tax now is not where our forefathers came from, is that now we are there and our destinies are tied together. We either change Liberia for the benefit of all of us or, or we will all collapse collectively. And that's what we're experiencing. All right. Uh... Well, those will be our last comment. Or Sam Wallace said, Ghana has done a great job or uh, activity uh, recruiting African-Americans to move to Ghana. It was hundreds of citizenship requests to African-American annually. But for us, we are hiding it. And it's only uh, Afri Liberians from the African-American uh, origin would not publicly address this. But when they are together or we, when they are with other African-Americans, they say, oh, yeah, we have our relatives in uh, Maryland or, or in uh, North Carolina and so forth. And that has been my own issues based on personal interaction. CDB, uh, CB Charleston. Well, not, how as I said before, Dennis, there's nothing to be, there's nothing to be, a, there's nothing to be ashamed for about. Every, yeah. every Liberian came from somewhere before their four bears landed in Liberia. So there's really nothing to be ashamed for. How can Pat... How can that part of the constitution that says any person of Negro heritage can be citizen? I believe this has helped to keep Liberia underdeveloped. That's uh, that's another angle. Well, there. yeah, I mean, some 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 some, some have argued that that provision, the constitution, whether one agrees or not, and 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 your 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 point is well taken, uh, is that it you know it it, it has. It has both historical roots and and current underpinnings. The fear was that if you open up citizenship to people of the non-Negro race, 
they will come in and they will dominate the society. Now, you know, we can we can debate that as to whether what what are that state of teens today. And one of the group in contemporary times that people are referred to when they make that argument uh, is the issue of the Lebanese. And my response to the Lebanese question is that they dominate the economy anyway. So, so what difference <laughs> will citizenship right. really make? Yeah, I mean, they already dominate the economy, so I don't think we'll make it a different whether they're citizen or not. Thank you so much, Dr. Kia. Uh, we've been discussing the dominant presidency, and from, we've known that we've known that from by a different name, the dominant presidency, the hegemonic presidency, the imperial presidency, or the King Kong presidency. Uh, Dr. Kia said, you know, the Barclay Plan, the Constitution of Liberia, and the Acts of the National Legislature established that framework of this what we know today as the King Kong presidency, and he has grown over time. And we've also discussed some reforms, the effect, first of all, and how we can cage this dominant presidency. I want to thank you so much, Dr. Kia. Let, uh, let's wrap this off. And um, if there's anything you want, I will- Thank you so uh, much, Dennis, for the invitation. I enjoyed the discussion as always. Yeah. If there's anything you want our listeners to take away from today, what would that be? Well, I would say to all of, all of your listeners, uh, both citizens and friends of Liberia, uh, I want to remind all of us that our destinies are tied irrespective of where our came from, where it came irrelevant. What is important is that, that they met in Liberia and we've got to do something to make Liberia better for all of us and for generations to come. Next Sunday, same time, we're going to be talking about the centralized state. And uh, this is something that uh, the Barclay Plan, again, we go to President Barclay, the Barclay Plan laid that foundation, and we're going to be discussing the centralized state or that centralized power that controls virtually everything. We're going to be talking about that. We always like to talk about the effect, the history of it, the effect, and how we can change it. Until then, from all of us here at Focus on Liberia, thank you for spending your evening with us. At, uh, we're going to Keep this going as part of Black History Month. We're going to be discussing this. We have other speakers uh, who are going to be discussing this. Dr. George Click here is one. We also have uh, Jason Carr will be also be here. We also have Dr. Timothy Nevin, who um, from uh, Cottonton University, will also be here to take a stab at Liberian history right here on Focus on Liberia as we commemorate Black History Month. Thank you again, Dr. Kia. We want to thank our listeners, our viewers, and even those who will watch later. Until then, we never close our broadcast without playing our closing song, which says, we are all Liberians. Whether you came before 1822 or after, or much, much later, we are all Liberians, and we must do everything to keep our country or to make it that imagined Liberia, the one that was created as an oasis for free people, People that walked from all the way when the empire disintegrated, they were looking for a place of refuge. They were looking for a free, they were looking for freedom. I thought you were running away from war, from pestilence, from diseases, from being captured and controlled as a slave. All that we've converged in this single place called Liberia. And so we are all Liberians. And that's the song we're going to leave with you tonight and say good night and God bless you. Thank you, Dennis. Good night. We all are the world.